our next guest, Bucky Brooks, NFL Network analyst. How, how do you get through this lull in the week, Bucky, in, in, in terms of getting to the championship games on Sunday? Well, see, right now I'm down in Tampa, St. Pete, for the East West Shrine game. Uh-huh. So I'm trying to fully immerse in the draft process. We got the East West Shrine this week, the Senior Bowl next week. So I am distracted by looking at the college prospects that are about to make their way to our league. All oh, right, see, that's right where we'll start at. Is that look? It's it's all, see. You are are you are you in full on draft mode just yet, or are you still dissecting what we had go on last week in the divisional round? I'm going back and forth because obviously I'm a football junkie. I can't uh, wait to see what takes place this weekend in the championship round. But I think the divisional round um, provided us with a lot of. I guess kind of learning lessons mm-hmm. in terms of the way teams are constructed, the way teams will be constructed going forward. Uh, this is the first time that we will see the top four scoring offenses in the final four. Uh, and so for an old school defensive guy who loves defense, I'm kind of having to change my tune that offense is what is going to take you uh, to the championship. And whichever team comes with the best defense with the high powered offense, those are going to be the teams that ultimately win the chip. So, Bucky, I'm going to throw uh, the four quarterbacks at you because our poll question today is, which QB do you trust the most all the way down to the least? And in order for me, I went Brady, Breeze. I went golf at three, and I trust Patrick Mahomes uh, the least of the group. In terms of those four, uh, how would you put them, put them in that order? Mm. In terms of trustworthiness, Um it's tough because, like, you want to give Tom Brady the Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> but I think if we go on, like, who has played and played well, man, Pat Mahomes deserves to be up there because he's had the best um, the way that he's played. So I would go Mahomes, mm-hmm. then I would go Breeze, then Brady, then Jerry Goff. And the reason I, I'm, I'm kind of down on Brady a little bit is he didn't really play well throughout the season. And I know that he played better. Um, in the divisional round, and the Patriots are kind of finding their identity in terms of how they have to play to win the chip, you still wonder if you pressure Tom Brady, is he going to make mistakes? We saw the mistakes in Pittsburgh. We saw him make some mistakes in Miami. And I know that as an older player, the one thing that you don't like is you don't want to get hit. So for Brady and for Breeze, if you can get pressure on them, they're more likely to change. With Pat Mahomes, I think Pat Mahomes is going to be who he's always been. I don't think the lights in the stage will be too bright or too big. I just think this dude is a rare player, a rare playmaker, and I think he is going to dazzle when he gets his opportunity on Sunday. NFL Network analyst Bucky Brooks joining us. And uh, before I get to the to the college side over the NFL draft side of it, Bucky, you were a former second round pick, and you play defense in this league, so you understand kind of what's in front of you. But uh, understand this for me, though, Bucky. At what point? did this league become so offensive-minded to a point where the top four scoring teams are in these, this championship game to where now that's all this league seems to be kind of moving toward rather than the old defensive ways of yesterday? Um, you know, like, obviously, what the league did, they made a concerted effort to make it about the offense. All of the rules um, over the last 10 years have been catered towards the offense. You can't touch receivers. You can't hit receivers hard over the middle. You can't hit the quarterback, but only in their gut. You can't hit them low. You can't hit them high. And so all of the rules have made it where they basically created a freeway on the field where everyone can just go and motor around and not have to worry about getting hit. And so the way that you play defense now um, has to change in terms of before it was all about bully ball, trying to beat you up, trying to jam and disrupt and do those kind of things. You can do that to a point. You just can't necessarily um, – you have to be able to live with the consequences, meaning like you have to deal with the penalties and stuff that would come with that. I will say this, though. Defense still matters, but you have to be able to score points on offense. And so mm-hmm. if I am a team that is building on my defense, I'm focusing on two areas, turnovers and red zone defense. Take the ball away and make people kick field goals as opposed to scoring touchdowns. If you do those two things, you can win a lot of games. He's the uh, NFL Network analyst, Bucky Brooks, join us. And he's also 
the co-host of the Move the Sticks podcast alongside Daniel Jeremiah, which I already know tends to spike around this type of year as one of the most listened to podcasts, Bucky. And that's where I'll transition over to college football, to the, the NFL draft. And I think I'll start with Kyler Murray first, with the decision to enter the draft and still seems to be on the fence. Is he committed to being an NFL player? Does he still have baseball in his future? How is that all going to, you think, I guess, go down over the next couple months? How will teams view him? Uh, There are a couple things for Kyler Murray. The first thing that he can do to eliminate a lot of questions is when he has the opportunity to sit with coaches and evaluators is to tell them, look, I'm a football guy. I want to play football. I want to be a quarterback in the National Football League. If he gives them a hard commitment that, if I am drafted, if I'm drafted high, I'm going to be all in on football. I don't think it would be an issue. The other issue that Kyler has to work around would be questions about his size. Um, Oklahoma just tweeted out a thing that he's 5'9", 7'8". <laughs> um, scouts who have been through there say he's 185 to 190. And I think the thing that works against him, there really hasn't been a precedent set for a player of that stature to have played successfully in the league. He will benefit from the fact that Baker Mayfield, Russell Wilson, Drew Brees have had success. But even with their success, some people are still going to say, yeah, but he's a much smaller player than them. The thing that works in his favor, he just played in the same offense as Baker Mayfield. Uh, When Baker Mayfield was at Oklahoma, Baker Mayfield goes to the league, has an outstanding rookie year. You now can look at Tyler Murray's tape, and you can begin to kind of make some assumptions on how his game would translate into the league. He is more dynamic. He is more explosive. He can throw the ball. He has big-time arm talent. He's not quite as precise or as accurate as Baker was during his last year, but he certainly is a guy that you can imagine having the kind of success in the league. And then ultimately, it's going to be a decision for teams. Are you a secure enough general manager in your job where you know, if I take a gamble on Kyler Murray and he is undersized and it doesn't work out, is it going to cost me my job? So those are the things that he has to work through. But is he worthy of being a first-rounder based on talent? Absolutely. Will he go in the first round? I think so. I think it's a high probability. I would say probably a 85 to 90% chance that he's going in the first round. I just believe that people are still trying to get their, their minds around the fact that we could have a 5'9 quarterback mm. going into the league. Are we okay with that? based on how the old standards and traditions were when it came to the scouting community. NFL Network analyst Bucky Brooks, and kind of to your point, you talked about Baker Mayfield and the relationship he had with Lincoln Riley, and then it's now Kyler Murray and his relationship with Lincoln Riley. And then, you know, right now it, it, the, the report is out that Jalen Hurts, the former quarterback at Alabama, will transfer to Oklahoma. He'll be with Lincoln Riley again. W- what does Lincoln Riley do for these young quarterbacks that seem to not only help out their draft stock, but make them so, uh, you know, to NFL teams so so worthy of being a, a top pick in the NFL draft. Well, I mean, I think the one thing that you have to understand about the system that Lincoln Riley employs, it is the air raid system. And so really one of the founding fathers would be at Washington State, which is Mike Leach. The system is really quarterback friendly. Uh, the, the thing about it, it really features a lot of concepts that are in the West Coast offense. Mm. And so – the shallow crosses, the stick routes, some of the other things that they do, some of those things do translate well to the league. I think the best thing that has happened to all of the guys that are playing under Lincoln Riley, you're seeing other air raid quarterbacks have success. And the more success that they have, the more teams are okay with taking guys from the system. Jared Goff came from the air raid system at Cal. Pat Mahomes came from the air raid system at Texas Tech. Uh, Baker Mayfield coming from Oklahoma. So we've seen three young quarterbacks come from that system and succeed in the league. They now know that you can go to Oklahoma, you can perform well in that system, and you still have an opportunity to be a guy that plays at the next level. I think that's an easy sell for Lincoln Riley when it comes to dealing with quarterbacks. I know you're still in your initial phases of looking at these college prospects at these all-star games. And when you start to dive in more into the draft, is there a receiver right now that you could possibly – take in the first round or if I'm a team do I really explore the option of bringing on an Antonio Brown or do you say more of a uh, wait and see what this draft has and go in the first round and grab a receiver 
Uh, there's no one that's going to give you the immediate bump that Antonio Brown would give you. Uh, if you're a team that's in the top five or top ten and you need a playmaker, Antonio Brown is going to be better than anybody that you can imagine bringing on. I think the big thing when you're dealing with Antonio Brown is what exactly are you bringing into the locker room? Everyone would tell you to a man he's one of the hardest working people when it comes to football. He's going to be a guy that really puts the time in and he's going to grind. However, there are other things that you have to deal with when you bring him into your locker room. You have to seriously listen to what the things are coming out of Pittsburgh, him being late, him being maybe a little diva-like when it comes to how he has had to be managed by coaches and some of his teammates. And then the fact that he didn't play for his team the last game, for some people, man, that is hard to get past that. Everything is on the line. You are arguably the best player on the team, and you didn't play. I think before you take on Antonio Brown, you got to sit down, you got to look him in his eyes, and you got to get a sense of his commitment to what you're trying to do. I do understand the fascination and the intrigue based on what he's done in this league. He is without question one of the top two or three receivers in the league. But depending on the way your team is constructed, you just have to make sure that he's going to be a positive influence on the rest of the squad, particularly if you have young guys in that wide receiver room. I got a couple more for you, Bucky. I got to get these in just because, you know me, my my mind's always going, especially around this draft time. And the one thing that we saw this year, we saw Saquon Barkley, but he was picked number two in the type of season that he had, possibly the NFL's rookie of the year, offensive rookie of the year. And then you see a Philip Lindsay, who is the undrafted guy out of Denver, who has an outstanding year as well, but they're both running backs. Le'Veon Bell's out there on the market. Did Saquon Barkley or Philip Lindsay, did they kind of hurt the market for a guy like Le'Veon Bell, or is he still worth possibly the price that he's probably going to garner on the free agent market? It's so funny that you brought this up because I just had this conversation with a running backs coach uh, in the league, and he said, look, I understand the fascination with everyone saying, hey, just go try and undraft a free agent. Outside of C.J. Anderson, Philip Lindsay, who are all of these undrafted guys that are really impactful players in the league? And it's not just about, like, the stats. It's about how many undrafted running backs are making defensive coordinators stay up at night. How many guys are revamping their systems to deal with the undrafted free agents? When you deal with a Saquon Barkley or a Zeke Elliott or a Todd Gurley, um, some of the other guys that have gone in the first round, you feel them, a Christian McCaffrey. There's a difference in the level of talent, and it can't just be extrapolated by fantasy football numbers. It is what do you have to do to slow and contain them? And so with the Levy and Bill, I think every defensive coordinator understands how special he is and what he brings to the table as a big body running back that is able to go outside, make plays as a wide receiver, run routes, come inside, pass protect, and also tote the rock. Hard to find those guys. And that's why when you see guys that can do all of those things, that's why they come off the board in the first round. I think for Levy and Bill, I don't think it actually impacts his value at all. I think people appreciate what he brings. I think it's just a matter of being comfortable with whatever he is going to be in your locker room. But I think he still gets paid like Ty Gurley and David mm-hmm. Johnson and all those other guys. Last one for you, Bucky, before I let you go back to watching film and scouting players. Uh, what is the the theme of this year's draft, do you think, so far with all the early entries? I, I was you know, hearing about the defensive line, heavy draft, defensive players. What's the theme of this draft so far since, as you start to un- unwind and, and unpack some of these players? I think we will be talking about playmakers, uh, defensive playmakers in particular. It is all about the D-line. You talk about the pass rushers and defensive tackles, but also the off-the-ball linebackers, the old-school linebackers that play the position like you used to play. Having watched Layden Vander S, watching Darius Leonard, watching those guys make immediate impacts, mm-hmm. teams are going to look to find those sideline to sideline playmakers who not only can impact the run game, but are dominant against the pass. Can they hit, run, and cover? Those are the ones that are going to come off the board early. I think we're going to see a lot of defensive guys go because it's about impact in the passing game. I think you'll see a bunch of frontline players on the defensive line and at linebacker go off the board in the first 20 picks. And the weakest position of this draft so far? Um, I mean, I think you, you're still kind of weak in running back this year. Okay. Uh, you won't get a consensus uh, first-round running back, even though there's some people that are excited about Jacobs, the running back from Alabama. It's not 
the kind of running back draft that we've seen the last couple of years where we've seen running backs going the first round, I would say that is probably the weakest part of the draft. Make sure you listen to the Moving the Sticks podcast alongside Daniel Jeremiah. It'll be Bucky Brooks and always look forward to listening to you and uh, also listening and also watching me uh, listening to you on Twitter as well. I listen. When you talk, I listen. So when you're typing, I'm actually <laughs> hearing Bucky Brooks's voice talk to me when you're on Twitter typing. So always appreciate the time, Bucky. Hey, thanks so much, Kurt. Talk to you soon. <laughs> that was NFL Network analyst Bucky Brooks joining the Rich Eisen Show. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.